Yes, look. My Lord, I was making the point that there's a proper basis. Uh, I don't mean that in any particular specific legal standard. It's pretty clear why we want this material. I was indicating that Mr. Doris had seen records which showed payments by Mr. Soriano, Mr. Soriano or his company to Mr. Rosari. And then I was going to take you to Miss Champion, who said the same thing at page 32 in the supplementary bundle, paragraphs 20 to 22. Yeah. And in particular, paragraph 22, it shows the link. That link is then repeated in the memo in further support of the application on behalf of the defendants. And I don't ask you to turn it up because you've seen it already. But it's at page 121 of the supplementary bundle, and the relevant pages are, point, are page 126 and 127. Have you, have you asked them, um, ever asked them for, to voluntarily, sorry, split infinitive, voluntarily to disclose? No, no, we have not. And the reason we have not is, and this is maybe after the event, you might think, go to 148 in the bundle, the supplementary bundle. I think it's the second. Oh, the second supplement. There are many supplementary <laughs> bundles in this case, but it's yes. a supplementary bundle with the number page 148. <laughs> um, your Lordships and Your Ladyship see Mr. Azari pleaded guilty to hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, then we where, did where, write. Where did he plead guilty? This is in April 2022. In which country? Sorry, my lord? In which country? In America. I mean, America is rather New vague. York court, apparently. Uh, it's a New York court, exactly. Right. And then, uh, if you go to 177... Uh, I mean, just for future reference, this is an exceptionally um, unwieldy bundle to use electronically, because hmm. it's... We just it's hopeless to have it all cut up into different... I mean, I could not agree more, and you think it's unwieldy electronically. You just can't imagine how bad it is in hard copy, because <laughs> you never know where you can find anything, basically. And the numbering starts and stops. It's dreadful. I've given up hard copies. <laughs> no. Yes, I'm one seven very seven. wanted to do that. Uh, could, you, could, I, could I take your logic to page 177 and 178 in the supplementary bundle, flag 21 for what it's worth, and th this is Mr. Um, Mr. Is Rex Shuffham's. Exactly. Yeah. And this is this is uh, Rex Shuffham Law, who is Soriano's Mr. Soriano's lawyer, writing to Gibson Dunn, uh, uh, and we're talking about the documentation in relation to the Azari material, and then look at the top of the page one seven eight. So there's nothing pleaded. They are plainly not going to cooperate in relation to sharing the link. And then, my lords, if you could go over the page to 179. Now, which bit? The whole thing? 179, my lord. Mm -hmm. The article. The article. And this is reporting uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Azari's um, it's, it's talking about the fact that Mr. Azari currently in US custody this is dated May, because he's been convicted in April used Indian hackers to conduct surveillance operations for ultra wealthy Russians, a reporter said in a court fi filing late Wednesday and then uh, Mr. Scott Stedman who is the second defendant here quotes what, it's quotes what he says and then if you look at the bottom paragraph in an email to Reuters Soriano's lawyers, etc. Yeah. They absolutely deny the link. And they deny it in correspondence with us, and they deny it publicly. 
So you can see why we want the material. Uh, the terms <coughs> sought are Y, that's page 79, if you've looked at, in the, I think it's the core bundle. I wouldn't be sure of that. Um, there's an issue about width. Is that too wide? It's, it's said. Um, uh, we have been willing to discuss limitations with the claimant's lawyers in America. If you go to page 19 of the supplementary bundle, look at paragraph 18. On the 27th of January, could I invite your lordships and your ladyship to read to the end of paragraph 18, which is on page, 20, uh, page 21 in the bundle? But on the face of it, if the purpose is to identify evidence supporting the view that there's a connection between USG stroke. Soriano and Azari. Yeah. Uh, the wording of the uh, Section 8, 782 application is ludicrously broad. Well, it's the it's basis. No, in no way tied to that it's, issue. It's the basis upon which we apply. It's the basis we put to the American court. It is ultimately for the American court to decide whether they think it is too wide. Uh, it does not make it abusive or unconscionable that it's too wide, particularly when we say, as we do in the memorandum in further support, that there may be other material as well beyond the Azari material. And it's for the American court to adjudicate on that. Well, does the American court have the wherewithal to do so? I mean, does it have... I, I haven't, I'm afraid, gone through checking which documents are in front of the American court and which are not. But does it have all the material that would enable it to narrow the scope it, of it? It has a memorandum in opposition made by Mr. Soriano's lawyers saying it's too wide. Therefore, they can determine on the basis of those submissions what view they take in relation to it. I mean, I asked Mr. Fulton whether he'd put forward a, a narrower formulation, and he hasn't. Well, he did, and, and this this bit that your lordship's tired of reading quite quickly mm. uh, is 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 saying we asked them for a yes, more so is your job to narrow it? That's what, that's what they're saying. Uh, well, I mean, that's what we're saying is let's, let's have a discussion yes. about it and see what you want. Mm. And then if you if you go to one seven one in the same bundle, you can see the same uh, 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 um, issue in the sense that this is an account that we gave. This is our recording of the of the discussion that took place and if you look just it, it's it's a, it's the as it were foundation document for the paragraph in Mr Doris's affidavit and if you look at uh, the third paragraph the last sentence this is page 171 You made clear that you did not think the subpoena should issue at all, so you're not willing to discuss whether it could be narrowed to address Mr. Soriano's alleged concerns. You also mentioned you considered the document sort irrelevant. We disagreed. And then, just a separate point, uh, uh, we also made the point uh, that if they wanted protection in relation to... Hold on. I was going to make a point, but it's a bad point. <coughs> um, we met, we tried to make progress, we asked them for a restriction, they wouldn't give one. If you then look at the, if you look at the um, para 12 to 16 of Miss Champion's affidavit, which is at page 30 to 31, you'll see what powers the court has got. Paragraph 12, 
12 to 15, and what paragraph 12 to 15 of Ms. Champion's affidavit says, the court can narrow the scope and they can give protective orders in order to protect against confidentiality. That's page 30 and 31. And if you just go to paragraph 7, the same affidavit, the ability to reduce the scope continues after the leave to serve the subpoena, and the courts generally require the parties to meet and confer over the nature of the objections and any potential discovery dispute. <clears throat> and then paragraph 8, every stage is subject to the oversight of the Federal District Court. And then if you look at paragraph 9, the standard that they reply, parties may obtain discovery regarding any non-privileged matter that is relevant to any party's claim of defence and proportional to the needs of the case, considering the importance of the issues at stake in the action, the amount of controversy, the party's relative access to relevant information, the party's resources, the importance of discovery in resolving the issues, and whether the burden or expense of the proposed discovery outweigh the likely benefit. Sorry, where were you reading from? Paragraph 9 of Miss Champion's affidavit, page 29. Paragraph. Sorry, I yeah. thought we were I'm sorry. reading 12 and 13. I was... Sorry, I was going <laughs> okay, 12 good. and 13. I'm going too fast. No, it's good. I, I'd read 12 and 13. I thought we were going forward rather than backwards. No, so I'm sorry, that's my fault. Um, uh, 14 and 15 deal with confidentiality. And then I went backwards to 7, which is page 28, to indicate the approach that the American court takes. And the American court says the parties have got to meet, they've got to try to agree an approach. They, the discovery process is subject to the oversight of the federal district court judge. She was of high standing. And then the approach overall is as set out in paragraph 9. So th there is the material, factually. There's a proper basis. It might be overbroad. There is meetings and judicial oversight to deal with both width or breadth and confidentiality. What should the approach of this court, the Court of Appeal, be to what's happened below? The application for an order restraining on grounds of unconscionability, a 1782 in America, is in the nature of a final order. There is going to be no review of the order that is made by the court below, and the result of the order does not in any way depend upon the final result in the action, and no undertaking as to damages is given in relation to it. So although the form may be an application within existing proceedings, the right way to look at this is that it's a final injunction. And in support of the submissions I've just made, I didn't ask you to look it up, I would invite you to look at Mr Justice Mayo's analysis of the position in Draymore at paragraph 114. And that is the inspiration for the submissions I've just made. And he says no undertaking in damages is required? He does say that, yes. Ever? He doesn't say ever, but he says that's why you should treat it as a final order. And the reason for that is you're not going back on this. How will you ever resolve whether the undertaking is to be triggered? He doesn't say that, but that, I assume, is the thinking behind it. My lord, my lady, the, the, the two conditions are unconscionability and the exercise of discretion. In relation to unconscionability, that is, in a phrase used by Lord Justice Warby in another context, a multifactual, multifactual 
multifactorial <laughs> evaluation of a set of circumstances. A court, the Court of Appeal should be very slow to interfere unless there's an error of law or it's a perverse evaluation. And the second consideration, assume unconscionability is made out, is whether as a matter of discretion the judge should award such an injunction. And again, that is a matter that the courts will, the Court of Appeal will only interfere within the circumstances well known to this court, namely there's something perverse or wrong with it. My Lord, um, the, the, the approach to this application, as opposed to the general approach, this is an application to prepare and get material for a trial. Uh, Lord uh, Brandon in, um, uh, Cal in South, Car Ca South um, Carolina is the Fonzo Terrigo of how one deals with this, and I would sub respectfully submit that the way to approach it is this. What Lord Brandon is saying is it's for parties to determine for themselves how they prepare and present their case for trial. The English court will not exercise control over the way a party decides to prepare for trial. The parties in preparing for trial are entitled to use any lawful means they may. If a foreign court provides them with a basis which is wider than that given in England, then they are entitled to use it. The only limitation, apart from any contractual limitation, which does not apply here, is if the use or the steps taken by a party is unconscionable, primarily, though not only, in the sense that it unduly interferes with the court process in the UK. In South Carolina, the defendants could not get hold of certain agents' property under English discovery rules. They could get them under American discovery rules, and the court, the House of Lords, in effect, said, that's fine, no objection. That doesn't in any way interfere with our process. Could I just uh, take you to what I say are the key bits of the judgment? Uh, my Lord, uh, 32F, this is on in flag 3, I think, If you see, it says, my lord, seven provinces, al Ahilia and Arabian Seas, the re reinsurers, are by reason of their position remote from the facts and the dispute, and obliged to rely for detailed information about them on such documents as they can obtain from South Carolina, who the re insurers, or PGA and Campbell Husted, who are the insurance brokers on the one hand and the loss adjusters on the other. The latter two, however, were not the agents of South Carolina in connection with the relevant transactions, it follows that discovery of documents by South Carolina in the two actions in England would not extend to relevant documents held by them. So they can't get the material out of them under ordinary discovery. The defence that, South, that uh, the re reinsurers want to plead you can see at just above letter D. So which page is it? 32, my lord. 32 in what? In the, uh, sorry, I'm going, uh, it's in the, uh, the judgment, the, the report of the House of Lords in South Carolina. At page 32 of the report or 32 of the Sorry, bundle? yep, 32. it's page 32 of the report, page, I apologise for that, page 49 of the bundle. I'm on the wrong one. Right, 32 D. Exactly. Yeah. Those are the defences they wanted to run. They needed the material from the two sets of agents. They weren't entitled to them under English discovery rules at that time. And at the time that Lord Brandon is talking about here, all that's happened is that there's been a summary judgment application at which counsel has indicated that those four defences are Correct. Exactly. impossible. That's right. 
by the time the matter gets to the House of Lords, defences have been uh, filed. So it is easier to see what the issues in the case are. But if you read the judgment of Lord Brandon, that makes absolutely no difference, I would respectfully submit, to the conclusion that he reaches. If um, we then go to the guts of his judgment, if you go to um, uh, page 41, internal numbering 41, external numbering 58, Uh, if you go just above letter E, could I invite you to read just from the words, although neither Hobhouse chair, first instance, down to, I shall consider each of these grounds in turn. Now, you, you, you have been struck immediately by the fact that Mr. Fulton's submissions echo the submissions of, uh, or the conclusion that the Lord Justice Griffith and Mr. Justice Hobhouse reached, nearly the English court's got to keep control of this, the submissions of Mr. Rokerson in the case. And then go on to G, uh, see what Lord Brandon says. invite your lordship to read to letter C on 42. Yeah. It's absolutely clear what he's saying. He's saying, we're not controlling how you prepare your case. Up to you <coughs> to prepare your case. The fact that you've got more powers in America doesn't matter. If you can use them lawfully, use them. And then if you just go to 42E, the, the, uh, do you see the words just above E, be that as it may? Down to F. And then find, it is at the end of that paragraph, F to G, Lord Brandon says, well, it's being argued that you could go for, you could go make an application for, get the, the English court to make a request to the American court, that's Order 39 in those days, that is rogatory, to which Lord Brandon says, why should you? I can see no good reason why the reinsurers should not have chosen whichever of these two alternatives they preferred. So, I respectfully submit that South Carolina is 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 authoritative proposition that we won't the, the English courts will not control how you prepare your case that as long as it's lawful you're entitled to do that which is appropriate unless it is unconscionable and my learned friend has has uh, uh, referred you to what unconscionable means at 41c It's difficult and would be probably, this is page 58 of the internal numbering, 41 of the case numbering. It is difficult and would be probably unwise to seek to define the expression unconscionable conduct in anything like an exhaustive manner. In my opinion, however, it includes oppressive or vexatious or which interferes with the due process of the court. Um, it's absolutely clear that he's saying the fact you can get more discovery abroad is not by itself well, interfering. Assume you're right about that. Yeah. Uh, Lord Falconer, the, as I understood um, Mr. Fulton's argument, and I did test it, as you may have noticed. I did. Um, he says there is here an improper motive, and I'm reading my note, to seek to find amongst foreign material evidence to amend your pleadings, because there's a principle of libel law that the defendant has to articulate with specificity 
what facts the claimant has to meet in the litigation. And those are the ground rules that the claimant engaged um, when he began his action. And you are undermining, effectively, those ground rules. So effectively, he says, it's an abuse because the ground rules of libel litigation says you can't just um, change the goalposts at every stage. You, um, you libeled, uh, presumptively, uh, you libeled the claimant, and you have to plead uh, what the, your basis for doing so was, and you can't go fishing for further information. Now, why does that not put this in a different category? category from South Carolina where it's ordinary commercial litigation, you go and get whatever evidence you can and amend your pleadings as you choose. Because first of all um, what Lord Brandon is saying is we, in the English courts do not exercise control or accept the proposition that because, you, because you've started in England you're bound by the, the actual detailed approaches that the English court takes. But and that's what Rob Brandon is saying. Couldn't, couldn't he say, well, libel is different uh, because for the reasons given in um, Yorkshire Providence, yeah. it, you've already libeled the guy, presumptively, yeah. and uh, you've got to say what your defence is to that, and you shouldn't libel the guy and then be able to make it worse by uh, fishing for information to make good some defence you didn't know about before. Well, That's the principle. Yes, is, really. and that, he, he, in the course of debate with the court, rather abandoned the proposition that libel was different, though from time to time he went back to well, it. Well, he went back to it several times. But test that. Suppose I am a ship owner, yeah. and I sue my insurer to be paid for my ship sinking. If the insurer wants to plead that I scuttled the ship, he has got to plead that I scuttled the ship. He can't make me prove that I didn't scuttle the ship. Suppose that a newspaper says, I scuttled the ship. Is it seriously to be suggested that the insurer can get a 1782, but the newspaper cannot? Because that is the consequence of the submission that Mr. Fulton is making. A commercial person can get the material under 1782, but the newspaper or the media outlet cannot. Is there any, any situation in which you would accept it is abusive to pursue a, a 1782 in a situation of this kind, as opposed to the situation of the cases we know? Where it, junctions have been if, 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 if there might be a situation where, for example, if it was said, I've got absolute, uh, this, is, this, is, this is, as it were, the conclusion of a court was, I've got absolutely no idea whether or not the plaintiff did what he or she did, but I'm going to ask an, an American court under 1782 if they could just let me have access to all his records, who knows what, what I might find. What if you didn't have the Gibson Dunn material? Uh, what if well, you didn't have that? Uh, possibly, but we do have the Gibson Dunn material. Well, then why haven't you limited your application to the Gibson Dunn, um, Im the implications of the Gibson Dunn material? Because we say that the implications of the Gibson Dunn material, coupled with the denials, indicate that there may be more, and that's a perfectly legitimate conclusion to reach. But whether I am right or whether I am wrong about that depends upon what view the American court takes, not what view this court takes. Well, why can't we say it's not appropriate in English defamation proceedings to go fishing for a defence you don't know about, so it should be limited? Because with the greatest of respect, you should not interfere at this particular point. You should trust the American court in relation to it. They are perfectly capable judges who will be able to hear all the material that um, they have heard, and they should make a decision in accordance with their norms. But according to Intel, they're helping us. Well, look what Intel says. Should we look at Intel? Which is to be found. I mean, it's not what the statute says, but who am I to doubt the 
no, well, 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 Intel, of the United States. Intel, uh, well, let me shape let me. and form of uh, Justice Ginsburg. Sorry, so have I missed that, my lord? I said, who am I to doubt the United States Supreme Court in the shape and form of Justice Ginsburg? You're not. You're, I'm not asking you even to to to, to Mr. Justice Ginsburg shows a was degree Mrs. of Justice. sophistication, my lord, <laughs> that one would very much expect in both courts. If your Lord, if Mr. Justice Ginsburg is confronted with an argument as to whether or not this discoverability is... in the local court is required. Uh, this is not Ruth Ginsburg, is it? It's not. No, it is Stephen Ginsburg. Oh, OK. Sorry. So it's, it is a Mr. Justice, or they're not called Mr. Justices or Mr. No, Justices. no, no. OK, sorry. I've, uh, and then of course I can doubt him. Mm, uh, my lord, if one goes to uh, <clears throat> deep uh, page one six one in the bundle of authorities, possibly. <laughs> Sorry, one six one. Internal page. Uh, number twelve. Okay, possibly. Our bundle, I think Intel, Intel starts at one eight four. So. Uh, Is it, what, what, <coughs> Mr. Lord Justice Warby is, is helping me in the page numbering. Well, I think so, but, but um, internal page 11 would be um, page uh, 194 in the right. internal numbering. Okay. And it's actually also 194 electronically, which is a remarkable coincidence. Does your Lordship... I mean, Justice a... Breyer, who, was, who is now just retired, Stephen Breyer, dissented, right? And I'm on that page. Right. Well, if you, if, if you were to... Six in the top if you go... Um, go back. Yeah. Do you see paragraph two hundred and sixty, which is just under the heading D? Yeah. Uh, what they then discuss is um, we next take up we take up next the foreign discoverability rule in which lower courts have decided, and the foreign discoverability rule is you shouldn't be able to get under seventeen eighty two more than you could get under the foreign courts rules of discovery. And then uh, if you go over the, to the next paragraph, the next column, Intel raises two policy concerns. You see? Yeah. yeah. And then I just invite, because they, they, they give their view on South Carolina. draw the distinction between uh, a foreign nation limiting discovery and um, an objection to aid from the US. Precisely. Government. And it's saying, actually, ask yourself the question, are the, is the local court, the English court here, going to use the stuff that we get? We obviously would use the stuff. It's not inadmissible here. There may be, different, there may be reasons for difference between one discovery regime and another, but that's not a reason for not making an order in this case. And it's absolutely echoing Lord Brandon in South Carolina. And uh, may, I, may, I, may I put this as, as, as very starkly as I can? You can say, if you want, as the Court of Appeal, in libel cases, we don't think you should go beyond the pleaded case, or you shouldn't go beyond a case that's made out. But I would respectfully submit that would lack both comity and wisdom. I would respectfully submit that, that you should leave it to the American court. Because you will end up in a situation where you are signalling to the American courts, the federal courts, have a more restrictive regime in libel than in anything else. And in my respectful submission, the right course is to leave it to them. They are not in any way trying to, inverted commas, mess up the English courts. They are saying, in effect, you may find it's helpful to us. But if you go back to what Ms Champion's evidence was, yeah. which was to the effect that discovery and production orders under uh, 172 uh, will be made by reference to what is relevant to the, to 
of the claim almost what's relevant by reference to the pleading. No, I don't think she is saying that. I what think she's saying, saying what she's what, saying. She's, she's saying what's relevant to the case. 1782 is talking about is it to be used in foreign proceedings? The test, as my Lord, Lord, the Master of the Royal said, is uh, it, it, you can get your application, you don't get it as of right, but if you satisfy the requirements, it's for use in foreign proceedings. There is no limitation simply to, 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 to um, uh, as it were, pleaded issues. And indeed, that I understand not expressly, but when she, you took, helpfully took us to it this afternoon, yeah. um, she said something like, by reference to the... Yes. To the claim of the defence and proportionality. Are you talking, uh, my lord, about, uh, it's in para nine yes. of her affidavit? Yes, which is supplementary bundle uh, 29. Thank you. Parties may <coughs> obtain discovery regarding any non privileged matter that is relevant to any <coughs> party's claim or defence yes. and proportional to the needs of the case. So the question <coughs> is. Does that, when it refers to relevant to any party's defence, mean the pleaded defence? Right. And then my respectful submission, there's no basis for so restricting it. We could read it to say that the scope of available disclosure is limited to something that could conceivably be relevant to anything that might be a defence or a claim. I, I mean, I, I would adopt that, and I would support myself in adopting that by saying that... Mr. Justice Stephen Ginsburg, with the majority of the United States Court, Supreme Court, say you can get an order even when proceedings are only contemplated abroad. So if proceedings are only contemplated abroad, then it, it can't be dependent upon the pleadings. If your lordships were to look, and your ladyship were to look at, it might be, it, it certainly isn't page 150, but if Lord Justice Warby would give me a clue as to what the first page of Intel is. <coughs> uh, it is 184. At page 184, <coughs> uh, if you look at holding four, didn't have to be even imminent. Exactly. It's just reasonably contemplated. I just find the bit where they say that. If one looks at page internal numbering 11 uh, under heading C Does your lordship see the paragraph at the very bottom of the page which says, in short... I think that's internal 10. Internal... <laughs> your internal is different from my internal, but is that right? <laughs> that's what one would expect. In short, you see, we reject the view. Yes. And then if you read that paragraph... So, is this adjudicative proceedings? These are rather odd proceedings. Yes. This is the European Commission yes, looking into exactly. a comp an anti-competitive thing. But uh, I'm referring to this, my lady, in order to, to, because you're, you're putting to me in effect what's Champ Miss Champion saying had to be pleaded, and that's not the flavour of 1782. So your, your, your position is that, um, in principle, 1782 is available to provide a discovery of anything that could support a defence to these claims. Yeah. Um, the purpose, you say, uh, of this application, or the primary purpose of it, is the relatively narrow one that you've identified relating to hacking, the ac hacking allegations of Mr. Azari, but it may yield other things. I put it on the broader... Yes, I, 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 I accept all that my Lord Lord Justice Warby has said 
subject to this, that the way I would put it is the Azari allegations are obviously materi highly material, but I say they indicate that it makes it legitimate to go for the banking material. And you, you, I mean, your lordship. But, but that couldn't go, could it, to um, support an allegation if it's relevant that uh, Mr. Soriano, Mr. Soriano, was aware of foreign interference in the 2016 um, well, it presidential would, elections? Rather, different. it would. It would depend to whom payments were made. If he was involved in making payments to people who were said to be involved in that, then it could be relevant in relation to that. But. Uh, your, your Lord, my Lord, Lord Justice Warby is, again, I say this with respect, is making a mistake. Well, what would we do if we were the English court in relation to this sort of application? You well, would I think, think what I'm testing is how far beyond, um, for the purpose of, uh, of assessing the grounds of appeal, yeah. how far beyond what we might do um, you're, you're seeking to go. That's really what I'm trying to well, explain. I'm putting my case on, I've got the Azari allegations, there might be more. If you say that's a bit of fishing, that might be a bit of fishing. Would the American courts allow it? Suppose the position were that they were quite favourable to journalists in relation to this, more favourable than the English courts were. Does that mean English courts have got to say, in order to give effect to a principle, which isn't the one expressed in Yorkshire Providence, but something bigger, we don't want you to do that? And I'm respectfully submitting that is not a legitimate approach of the English court. You have to, you, you take 1782 in a sense as you find it. If it messes up English procedure, then you can stop it. But what you can't do is if it produces proofs that the English courts would use, then the person in preparing his case, who is not under the court's control, which is what Lord Brandon is saying, is entitled to use it. Now, what are the sorts of examples that give rise to messing up an English case. Well, you, you've, got the, you've got the cases in front of you. Uh, uh, I'll come back to your problems in a moment, if I may. But they are South Carolina. It doesn't mess it up. But it's just getting material from the agents. Bankers Trust, it does mess it up. Lord Ma Mr Justice Mance, as he then was, says, because the case is over. This is a huge new area of inquiry, which Mr Justice Longmore and he have said no to already once, and you, there must be an end to litigation. Can I take your lordships to Bankers Trust? And your, is it, you don't have tabs to look at. Uh, tab four? We, we do, yes. I mean, uh, it's Bankers Trust. Uh, internal numbering, and I've got a Westlaw edition of it, is um, it's 124. Uh, no, sorry, 13 good, internal. Not a good number, 124. <laughs> uh, what, 13? Uh, uh, can you, well, okay. What, what, what word are you looking for? Where does it start? I'm looking at, I've already indicated why, in my opinion. Has your lordship's got that? No. Is there a more interesting word? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I, I've already indicated why, in my opinion, the English court is better placed to assess the background implication and propriety of the present section 172. Page 55 of the PDF. Ah, yes. yes. We've already been here, I think. Thank you. It's uh, oh, okay. page 55 page, yeah. internally. Just invite your lordship and your leadership to read the paragraph that begins, I've already indicated, and then the paragraph in the present circumstances. Remember, sorry.
So he, he, he's, I would respectfully submit, obviously right. You can't start a whole new train of inquiry after the trial is over before judgment. And I'm just going to put a stop to that. It messes up our procedure in England. Omega, which is Mr. Fulton, who is completely on top of all of these materials, if you could tell us what page in the internal numbering it was. Momentarily. Omega Stance said 69. 69. Okay. Uh, what was, there was a fraud trial coming in England, and what the defendant did is go and use 1782 to depose the witnesses the, pla the claimants were going to call. That's para 7. And Peter Gross, sitting, as he then was, says, don't be ridiculous. You're, you, the reason he says you can't do that is if you go to uh, para uh, 23, which is at page internal numbering, and my numbering is 140. I don't know that might be external numbering. Uh, He said, look, look you, you can't have two shot bites of the cherry, and what's more, they might not turn up for the trial here if they have a bad time when they're being deposed. Yes. And he's obviously right about that. And then uh, the next one is Benfield, which is Mr. Justice Langley. Uh, which is... And that is not, in fact, a 1782 case. This is, this, is, this is in effect or not in effect on all fours with Omega. This is a claim being brought by a claimant alleging that the defendants poached a team of traders in England. The English proceedings would be the lead proceedings, but there were also some proceedings in the background in the States. A few weeks before the trial in England, which is on an expedited basis, the defendants sought to depose the plaintiff's witnesses in America, and they're all based in England, as part of the American proceedings, even though these people were going to give evidence in the lead trial in England. And Mr Justice Lang said, absolutely not. It's exactly the same point as the Omega point. If your lordship uh, goes to page five in the judgment, And he sets out the law from paragraph 17. The guts of his decision is paragraph 22. I don't know if you've got that, page 6 internally. Well, it's in a different bundle, I think. It's in your, it's in a respondent's authority. Okay, bundle. right. Okay. It's in a, right. I don't really have any bookmarks. Oh, right. It's tab 4. Tab 4. And it's called Benfield and Richardson. Uh, yeah. my, uh, my, um, which record, paragraph? it says tab 17, so I'm with yeah. the master's roles on that which one, but I'm obviously... Which paragraph wrong. in the judgment? Sorry, my lord? Which paragraph? Uh, paragraph, uh, first of all, paragraph 17. If you go to over the page, paragraph 22, it's the same point as Omega. And then if you go to, I mean, do read it at your, at your leisure, but 23 little 9. Mm. Eon is the <coughs> You say obviously. And I say, sorry, my lord. You say obviously. Obviously, yeah. And then uh, the last one in the in the records of this is Draymore, which is tab nine. Is it tab nine in yours or mine? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's not tab. It's, 
Anyway, we got three more. We got three more. Yeah. Draymore is a case where the claimant and the defendants, uh, the de claimants sell fertilizer to the defendants in India and the rest of the world. Evidence emerges that the sellers, Draymore, have been bribing two employees of the defendants. Proceedings are brought in Cyprus for Mareva's and information, and in the BVI, for damages for the bribery, in relation to the rest of the world, and arbitrations are brought in London for um, damages for the bribe by the victim of the bribery. The victim of the bribery, the defendants, seek a deposition and documents from the lead trader of Draymore and documents relating to what on earth was going on, because what is available is payments by Draymore into offshore accounts of the two people it is said were bribed. And the, the um, uh, Draymore fight tooth and nail in America to avoid giving the information by Mr. Chauvin, and they fail. The Americans are willing to make, the, the federal court is willing to make the um, uh, order. They then come to England very shortly before the arbitrations and say set it aside as unconscionable, effectively on the Omega and um, uh, uh, Benfield basis. And Mr Justice Mayles says no to that. And he, he, he says no at, at Paris 70 onwards. He, uh, uh, I don't know if you've got Paris 70. Yeah. Uh, he, it, it, the first point he makes is, you're asking for an injunction here in relation to BVI proceedings, and that's very unusual. It's different from all the other cases. Second, you're dealing with a case where the American courts already decided to make the order, and that makes it unusual. And then look at 73. and in particular the last sentence, I consider that Eurochem and ECGT have a legitimate interest. I haven't got time to take your lordships through it all, but M Mr Justice Mayles is taking a different line from uh, Peter Gross and Mr Justice Langley, and he's doing so obviously legitimately, I would say, because he's saying, why shouldn't the people who might be the victim of the bribe be entitled to pursue material in relation to it? It's plainly relevant in a broad sense to these things, and they can't get the information in any other way. So I am not going to interfere with 1782. And what's more, he says it doesn't interfere with the process in either the arbitration or the proceedings in the BVI or Cyprus. Now, uh, which side of the line does this fall on? I respectfully submit it's obviously evidence gathering. It doesn't interfere with the proceedings in the UK. And the approach of this court should be to leave it to the Americans. And the significance of comity is they got this power under 1782, they should use it as they see fit, which is different from the way that we use it, and with respect, we shouldn't interfere, because it's not unconscionable. Our application is not unconscionable. What about the role of motive? The, 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 in relation to motive, it is absolutely obvious what the motive is here, namely to get material that would be of assistance in relation to the libel and other 
proceedings here. What improper motive is being suggested? I'm looking at Mr. Fulton, and he's looking at me and not <coughs> suggesting one. Circumvention. But circumvention. But the, 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 in terms of... Sir, yeah. the, the motive to ask yourself about is not... Is there some... Is there some circum well... We are going in the US because, in fact, we can't go here. We can't. Well, you could. You could go against HSBC for, for non party disclosure. How? Because non party disclosure is subject to the same rules of relevance. See flood. That's agreed between the parties. See paragraph 13. So we're yeah, stuck. That's their point. That's, yeah. their point. that's what? That's their point. But that's my point <coughs> as well. Uh, uh, so uh, when you say motive, circumvention, means if you say this is circumvention, I don't say this in a disrespectful way, but if Mr. Fulton's submission is right that this is circumvention, then you get back to the foreign discoverability rule, do you not? Which Br Lord Brandon has rejected and Mr. Justice Ginsburg has rejected. It seems to me it's not so much motive as purpose. I know that it's a fine distinction. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's um, what you're aiming at rather than why you're doing yeah, it. There, uh, well, there are, on many sets of facts, there are differences. I, 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 am, I am not shirking from the fact that I can't get the material on discovery because of the pleadings point. And that's Yorkshire Provident. Yeah. But I couldn't get the material, whether it was a libel case or not. My understanding of Yorkshire Provident is that you're not allowed to go beyond the 30 cases of bad behaviour in an insurance contract, which is alleged against Yorkshire Provident. You can't roam freely. <coughs> And that's obviously right. Just like I can't go beyond the fraud I've pleaded in a commercial case. The pleading rule is the same. So the question is, does 1782 lead to the conclusion that you can only get by way of discovery what you can get in England? And the resounding answer of Lord Brandon, and actually all of those cases I've gone through, is that you can go wider. And I didn't, I didn't take your lordship to uh, uh, what each of those first instance decision cases say, but each one of them acknowledges that you can go wider. So if you look at man, I, I mean, I hardly dare do this because of the total incompetence of my part in relation to the numbering of it. But if you go to, if you go to um, uh, uh, it, Mr. Justice Mance acknowledges that you can go wider on internal numbering page three. The Bank's Trust. The Bank's Trust, exactly. Mr. Uh, Peter Goss does the same at paragraph 2 on internal numbering page 139 of Omega. They're all accepting the proposition you can go further. If you, if, 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 if Mr. Fulton's submission is right, then they're all wrong, and it's completely at odds with what Lord Brandon was saying. I mean, and you can't just, just can I ask you? I mean, I think we, we all accept that we can go wider under 1782. Yeah. Is it actually right to say that under 3117 of our rules, you can't get non party disclosure? Uh, where it is likely to adversely affect the case of the other party. Well, I mean, that is the, that's the term of 31.173a, and if it's necessary to dispose fairly of the claim and save costs, you might get it, particularly with 
the evidence you've got that the payments were actually made. Well, my Lord, first of all, you I'd, invite, I'd invite you to look at what Mr. Fulton says about that. Just, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a situation where the other side are not contending with that possible. Paragraph 13 of his, um, sub, of his um, skeleton. Well, he may be wrong too. <laughs> we could all be wrong. I mean, I, I, I just remember litigating our Pell and Downdale on this subject for years in a, a various <coughs> cases, one, one, if I remember, called Sumitomo Bank and some others. And, and I, mean, I think it's a difficult... I th the point I'm really making is it seems to me, at least at first sight, that it's a, it's a difficult point, essentially. OK. Assu I, I accept it's a difficult point, though. I mean, just let me show you Flood. Uh, yes, but, I mean, Flood is... That's the point about a class of documents. If, is if, your class, if your class encompasses something that's irrelevant, you're, you're stuck. Well, uh, Mr Justice um, Eady <coughs> makes n a number of general statements about it. Para 30, I don't know if you've got Flood. Yeah, flood is in that. Mr... I, I've got it at, at tab 8. Class of... Um, page 87 of the PDF. Then look at para thirty six. And para thirty nine. And para forty eight. The flavor of the approach that Mr Justice Ely takes after Mr Nicklin, as he then was, has very effectively captured the whole stage on behalf of a non-party to the proceedings, is to say words to the effect, look at the pleaded issues, you could only give them, you could only make discovery in accordance with the pleaded issues, and Mr Justice Ely, as he then was, accepts that. There's a peculiarity in this case because although we've been focusing on libel, yeah. there is also this um, data protection, protection claim yeah. uh, and an allegation of inac inaccuracy in relation to which the burden rests on the claimant. Correct. Um, you've pointed out that that doesn't precisely map onto the pleaded meanings yeah. in the libel cases. That yeah. There's a gap in what the claimant is asserting to be inaccurate. Yeah, yeah. But leave that to one side. Yeah. Outside that narrow gap, yeah. um, there's quite a, a close overlap between yeah. that which the uh, claimant is saying is inaccurate and that yes. which you're not pleading at the moment. Yes, yes. It's true. So there'll, be, there'll have to be discovery in relation to the data protection claim by Mr. Soriano in respect of those pleas. Yes that he says are inaccurate. Well, we can't decide at the moment what the scope of that discovery Precisely. would be in yes. this jurisdiction, but it does, it does, it does amount to a, a slight departure from what might be the standard picture yeah. in relation to a libel claim. Yeah. Could I just... Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that averse to what Mr. the Master Rolls is saying, namely, well, the precise scope of third-party disclosure is quite difficult to identify in quite a lot of cases. Whether it's this precisely the same or not, on the basis of what Mr. Fulton has submitted, it is the same. On the basis of the approach that Ms. Justice Eady took in flood, it looks pretty similar. Uh, 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 go to four, go, go, go. If you go back to South Carolina, which I've already referred to, 42G. And it's basically saying an argument was run. It's page 59, is it 59 in the external lumbering? Who knows? We go back to that. Who cares? Um, the, 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 um, the argument is being advanced, go for an order 39 uh, order uh, for letters of rogatory, which the English court then asked the American court, which is then the way, 
to get information. And uh, what Lord Brandon says to that is, I can see no good reason why the re-reinsurers should not have chosen whichever of these two alternatives they preferred. And I would respectfully submit there's no difference here. Yeah. Um, my Lord, uh, I haven't taken you to Yorkshire Providence. Uh, well, you, do, you don't need to spend a lot of time with Yorkshire Providence unless you want to. I mean, no, I mean, Yorkshire... You've all read it. Uh, you've all read it, and you've all read Arnold <coughs> and Bottomley as well, and they're absolutely the same, which is simply saying... And uh, it's saying, look, you've got to plead particulars of truth or justification, as it then was, in libel cases. And the libel in Yorkshire Provident was, this is an insurance company that doesn't pay. And in the, the, the defendants then pleaded 30 occasions when they hadn't done that. And the, 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 the uh, applicant for the defendant said, we want, we want another affidavit dealing with more. And they said, no. I, I would respectfully submit that although Lord Justice Lindley says it would be a wrong deal, if you could libel somebody, then force, then allow yourself to trawl through all his papers. That's exactly the same as in all litigation. The fact that, for example, after the Wolf reform, <coughs> people would try to limit discovery as much as possible, that was a policy decision made by the courts, doesn't mean that as far as 1782 is concerned, you've got to notify the American court of that. The other point about Yorkshire Providence, and I may already have made this point, so shut me up if I'm just repeating myself. What Yorkshire Providence and Arnold and Bottomley are talking about is the limits of English discovery. They are not talking about yeah. evidence gathering. Yes, well, that's, I mean, that is, that is really <coughs> the judge's main point. Exactly. Um, now, we, we're getting to a time when we want to leave. Uh, Mr. Fulton, a chance to reply. Indeed, my lord. Um, can, can, I, can I abusive litigation ground two? I've got nothing to say. Um, costs. I would simply say this: if a case was going to be made that the costs were to be decisive, then you would need a case of competing hardships in relation to it. You would have to, for example, have evidence that this was problematic for Mr. Soriano that there was an amount unpaid of costs of £85,000. And there was no such evidence. It could be, in some cases, it was material. But it was certainly not in this case. The judge specifically referred to it at paragraph 53 of his judgment. I don't ask you to turn it up. There is absolutely no reason to suppose that he didn't weigh it and conclude that it was a very light balance in the weighing, and in my respectful submission, that is right. Imagine if your lordships and your ladyship took the view that apart from the costs, you were minded to say there was nothing unconscionable about it. Would the non-payment of £85,000 constitute something that weighed decisively in favour of it being unconscionable? In my respectful submission, not. Then ground four, it interferes with case management. There are two aspects in relation to that that are effectively relied on. First of all, there may have to be an adjournment of the 2nd to the 3rd of March application because it may be more sensible to wait to see what's obtained on the um, uh, uh, 1782. Uh, well, the reason for that is, just like in South Carolina, the, the, it was because the defendants were resisting sorry, the claimants were resisting the making of the order, and that's what's causing the delay. But in any event, if the material does produce what it is thought that it would be producing, the interests of justice would require that you get that material, and that comparatively <coughs> short delay does not weigh strongly in the balance. I'm at a loss as to why there should be any adjournment. Um, none of this has any bearing on me. Correct. So the only thing that it might have a bearing on is whether your defences should be struck out. Yes. Um, and what commonly happens on strikeouts in all sorts of litigation, and in particular defamation, is there's a cross application for an amendment to meet yes. the objection. You've got no problem with that at the moment in relation to public interest, because if you want to 
amend. The 1782 application has got nothing to do with this. And if your defences are struck out, that will be because they don't meet the true meanings of the words. So that will have no bearing on 1782 either. So what's the problem with if 1782 proceeds, yields what you want it to yield, coming back later on and saying, well, actually, lo and behold, we've got this material we want to amend. We couldn't have done it sooner. That would be fine. I was worried about the Lord Justice, the Lady Justice Carr point, and Lady Justice Carr might have been worried about the point as well. But if you're telling me, no, don't you worry. Well, that's how I see it. Okay. We'll go for that. It's next week, isn't it? It is. It is. It's obviously not going to be, we're not going to get the 1782, the fruits of 1782 before that hearing. And in reality, the strikeout turns on the meaning. It's as simple as that. The strikeout of the meaning turns on the meaning. But not the public interest. Exactly. The public interest is different. Exactly. Exactly. But we could end, I mean, I'm not, I mean, we're bound to win. And as I say, the public interest strikeout doesn't have any connection with the 1782 application. Yes. I'm not pushing this point hard because it's Mr. Fulton's point. This is his desperate attempt, I would say, with the greatest respect to Mr. Fulton, to say that this was going to affect the hearing. But Mr. Fulton said in answer to Lady Justice Carr's question, no, no, or I read him as saying, this wouldn't be the end of the road on libel. And my Lord, Lord Justice Warby is sort of encouraging me more in relation to all of that. Well, I'm not saying it was the end of the road. I'm simply saying that if everyone's geared up for an application that really doesn't intersect with the 1782, then I personally find it hard to see a reason for putting that off. For one thing, knowing what the meanings of these words are would assist, if you are going to amend, to plead a case of truth to some different meaning. Yeah, no, and I'm not... Or if you're going to contemplate. I'm not very interested. You know what the target is. Yes, and I'm not... I mean, and once you get to that point, then what's the inverted commas interference? Right. And finally, five, which is give some instruction. I would respectfully submit, if you say in the Court of Appeal, maybe we should give instructions to the American court as to how they should approach 1782, I don't... I mean, they wouldn't mind, I'm sure, because they're very grown up, but I would respectfully submit that is not a wise course, and I would respectfully submit that if you gave that indication in this case, then there would be frequent applications made, not just in libel ones, but in other ones as well, in which you would try to get from a first instance judge in England an indication of what the American court should do. The question, as far as the English court is concerned, is, is it unconscionable or not? And if it's not unconscionable, that should be the end of the matter. But those are my submissions, unless there's any other point I can help you with. Thank you very much. Mr. Fulton. Lord Faulkner says he is squarely within the general rule of South Carolina, which I obviously accept exists. I say he is squarely within the exception. If we could look at South Carolina 26 of the report, page 24 of the PDF. In the summary of the argument of Mr. Alexander and Mr. Sumption, the court sees at the bottom, in the final line, when they were setting out what they said was the principle of permissiveness, they were obviously saying that they should be allowed to pursue the 1782 application. The defendants concede that there are limits to this principle. Thus, it is inapplicable where it would be unconscionable for a party to obtain discovery, for example, of documents which in this country are subject to professional privilege. And so just hypothetically, if one imagined a case in which the US law recognized no concept of privilege, and yet an application was made under section 1782 to seek to obtain such documents, the purpose of which being to circumvent that limitation under English law, then the 
the way in which it's expressed there in the argument of the defendants, that that would be unconscionable. <coughs> and conduct of that sort was conceded there as part of the argument to be unconscionable. But on the fact there, there was no such collision of concepts between the US law approach and the approach in England. Uh, it was perfectly obvious, and indeed Mr. Gross in the, in the Omega case uh, says that might be thought to have been a strong case because of the obvious relevance of um, those insurance documents um, to the case there. Uh, and here, by contrast, we do have a collision of concepts, a, a liberalism and a breadth of potential disclosure in the US, which is in tension with our English law approach towards the narrow scope of discovery, particularly in a libel context, uh, where the obligation is on the defendant to particularise the case, the factual case, um, which the claimant has to meet. And because there was no collision of concepts in, uh, in South Carolina, that's what left it able, left Lord Brandon able to say that it made no difference whether the route taken by the defendants was via 1782 or via his letters rogatory, because they amounted to the same thing. Uh, it would have made all the difference in the world if there had been the attempt to circumvent the principle of English law privilege, because in that case, the English court would have said in response to a request an application for a letter of request would have said, well, you're not having that because you're trying to circumvent um, the principle. Uh, and so, I mean, I was, I was pressed, obviously, before the short adjournment on the underlying principle, but we say it is the single overarching principle that the English court will act to restrain conduct which is unconscionable, and that embraces conduct which is vexatious, oppressive, or which interferes with the due process in England. And two of the important aspects of due process in an English libel action are that a defendant must plead and prove his case with particularity, and that such disclosure as the libel claimant or third parties are ordered to provide is confined to those pleaded particulars. So we say it's an interference with those elements of English due process, and therefore an interference, or therefore vexatious and oppressive so far as the claimant is concerned, for the libel defendant to go to a foreign jurisdiction to obtain orders of the foreign court, which an English court would in principle never make for itself, even if it had the power to do so, and would in principle never request a foreign court to make via a letter of request procedure. And when I say on these facts that the English court would never make such orders and never request that they be made by a foreign court, I rely upon the absence of a pleaded case Yorkshire Provident principle, and the fact that the effect of the orders is to open up the confidentiality of London bank accounts. And we say it can be tested this way if the claimants had made a disclosure application in London and been declined because the court said, well, none of that material is relevant because you haven't pleaded a case about that. Then we say it would be a stark and obvious abuse to then remake substantially the identical application to a foreign court where they'd already been turned down. And so we say, in short, that they cannot be in a better position by having avoided the English court in the first place and gone straight to the foreign court seeking orders which the English court would never have made, even if such powers existed to, to do so. Uh, and we do rely upon intel. We do, think, we do submit that that is uh, valuable and instructive. Um, it is clear that the US foreign discoverability rule, which was rejected by the Supreme Court, is the other side of the coin of the South Carolina general principle, that there doesn't need to be a match or a mapping of procedural powers. There's nothing inherently objectionable about the US court exercising powers which don't correspond exactly to those available uh, in England. Uh, but nevertheless, <coughs> the US court sees its role as being a supportive one rather than doing something which will undermine the English procedure uh, and be unwelcome so far as the English court is concerned. Uh, and uh, just in terms of just some, some references the, uh, in the internal page six um, of, the, of the report on the right hand side uh, and the left hand side of page seven and, uh, and on the right hand side of page 11 there's repeated reference to the statutory context to 1782 and the fact that it's designed to provide assistance. Uh, and there is there no reason um, for this English, an English court to be slow about curtailing um, uh, a, an application which it doesn't perceive to be of assistance, but um, which is, has 
purpose of, of undermining these English law principles. As to purpose versus motive, we respectfully adopt um, what Lord Justice Warby characterised as being the, the purpose being the key point rather than motive. I apologise if I used motive earlier. Um, I have refreshed my memory about the Lady, uh, Lady Justice Carr's judgment in, in Navigator. We're not in the territory of subjective motive. We don't need to investigate subjective motive. What we're talking about is, to whether, the, is, is whether the purpose of a given application is improper so far as the English court is concerned because it's seeking to do something that the English court has set its face against. And the purpose is here entirely clear, and it's admitted it is to go looking for an evidential basis which the defendants don't currently have um, to improve their defences. Um, Lord and Lady Yorkshire Provident, uh, I have had in mind um, the, the passage at page 7 um, where... Mr. Lord Justice Lindley says, I do not mean to say that leave cannot be obtained to add to the particulars. Of course it can. Um, he didn't specifically contemplate that amendment application being made after having seen disclosure, but clearly it would embrace that situation. Uh, and, and again, this comes back to the question of purpose. Um, that obtaining something by a sidewind um, isn't objectionable. Going out when that's your purpose of seeking the disclosure um, gives rise to different considerations. In another case, it might be hard to see where the line is to be drawn. I think this was my Lord the Master of the Rolls' um, point of how, how does one tell. And here, we're clearly on, on one side of the line because the express purpose is to see whether or not they can amend to plead defences of truth which don't yet appear. Uh, bottomly, uh, Lord Faulkner said that the pleading rule of fraud is the same as in libel. The pleading rule in relation to fraud is the same as in libel, but there's an interesting point made by made in, in Bottomley, which is at 16 of the PDF. This is Lord Justice Farwell, uh, at the bottom of page 156 of the report, 16 in the PDF. <coughs> he refers to Yorkshire Provident, uh, and then he says, at the final two lines, the rule in respect of allegations of fraud in an action to open up, open settled accounts is the same in that the allegation of fraud must be supported by a statement of specific instances, but is different in that the statement of one or more specific cases will, as a general rule, entitle the plaintiff to full discovery, not limited to the specific, to the specific cases only, and he cites cases. And then three lines further on, whatever may be the reason for the distinction, it's well settled, and the Yorkshire Provident case is a decision of this court on the point, and is, of course, binding on me. Um, so, insofar as there is a wider scope for obtaining disclosure in fraud cases or to open up settled accounts once one establishes an element of dishonesty uh, that on this court of appeal authority has no application in the libel context uh, where the libel defendant is more rigidly confined to his pleaded particulars and here obviously we're not even in the territory of particulars because nothing has been pleaded by way of a defense of truth at all um, to justify the disclosure that's being sought. And then just in the same report, if one could go a few further pages on to the judgment of Lord Justice Kennedy at 159, all three Lord Justices were, were in agreement in um, saying that there should be no disclosure here in support of the general allegation that um, the claimant was a wrong one. Uh, and, uh, and that there there's reference to um, Metropolitan Saloon Omnibus in the second paragraph sued for libel imputing insolvency to the plaintiff company <coughs> and then five lines from the bottom a merchant who is libel by a statement that he's insolvent has a right to maintain an action and the defendant has no right to say let me examine all his affairs for if you do I have some chance of proving that he's insolvent uh, and the, li the, the insolvency illustration we say is a neat one because the books and records, the balance sheet and cash flow analysis of uh, a libel claimant is quintessentially the sort of material which is confidential to the claimant uh, and that the defendant would love to get their hands on to rove through to see whether it supports the allegation of insolvency which they have made. Uh, but it's entirely clear that that's not something to which they're entitled as a matter of English law and procedure. Uh, and if records were in the possession of a US accountant, uh, then we say it would be an absolutely obvious abuse 
for the libel defendant to make an application under Section 1782 against the American accountant uh, trying to get access to the management accounts of the libel claimant to support the allegation of insolvency. That costs. Um, the claimant in a domestic debarring context doesn't need to show any evidence of the hardship resulting from the non-payment of, of the order. Uh, the starting point, he's entitled to say uh, that the defendant ought not to be allowed to continue until the costs are paid unless the defendant comes to court and say that would represent unfair stifling. So there was no burden on us to deal with the question of hardship. It was solely a matter for the defendant to show that in the exercise of the court's discretion, uh, it should not, the defendant should not be restrained from running up these further costs. The costs aren't, in fact, £85,000, as Lord Faulkner said. They £85,000 plus VAT, claims a private individual who can't recover his VAT, uh, plus over a year's worth of statutory interest. Uh, that's a significant sum which has gone unpaid, and we do say uh, that would have been a freestanding <coughs> basis to uh, restrain the <coughs> costs oppression and vexation of the claimant having to uh, resist the um, 1782 application in New York. Uh, and then finally, which touches on both grounds four and five, breadth, uh, we gratefully adopt the characterization by Lord Justice Warby uh, that the formulation in New York is ludicrously broad in terms of the purported justification uh, for this disclosure. Um, in principle, it could be cut down, uh, but it should not have, should not have been made in these excessively broad terms in the first place. And an application of that breadth, we say that's the clearest evidence of the impermissible fishing purpose of a defendant seeking to obtain the widest possible access to the claimant's confidential records to see what he can find. Uh, and, and we say that patently wouldn't have been tolerated um, in an application in, in London. Uh, and it is no less oppressive and vexatious, and indeed because of the duplication of costs, it can fairly be said to be more vexatious and oppressive for the claimant, the fact that they have gone off to a foreign court to obtain that information. Lord Bailey, there's my submission. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take time to consider our judgments in this case, and um, I'm afraid it's uh, relatively likely that you won't see anything before your hearing next week, and I'm not apologetic about that, I'm afraid. But um, uh, we'll deal both with permission and uh, with substantive uh, matters, if permission is allowed, finally. And when you get the judgments, will you please make sure that you deal with typographical corrections, agree the orders to costs, do not disclose, this is very important, uh, the judgment beyond the terms of the very strict embargo. If you do, you will be at risk of contempt proceedings being brought, as we now do in this court. And um, if you can't agree, we will deal with all ancillary questions in writing, not orally. Um, my Lord, just in terms of holding the ring, um, Lord Justice Warby, um, when this first came to him, had invited undertakings um, uh, or the clarification of the respondent's position as to uh, measures. Uh, my understanding is that the, the, the undertaking subsists, and so that even if an order were made, there will be no rece reception of any uh, Correct. of any document. Correct. We we accepted that undertaking, and it carried on until uh, judgment. And if there is an argument about its effect thereafter, we hope you will voluntarily continue it until we've had a chance to resolve the issues that arise. Thank you. All right.